Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Madeline. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 138. For new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90 minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as some extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. And as you know, recently in September, Madeline and I traveled up to Denmark to do a series of interviews with Danish designers and yarn producers. And in this episode, we're including one of those interviews. So we have a two part feature interview with the mother daughter team behind Knitting for Olive. And I'm really thrilled to share this interview with you because I think it is one of our best. So Penilla is the mother and she's the designer behind the company and Carolina is the daughter and she's responsible for all of the marketing and sales. So Knitting for Olive started very humbly at home around the kitchen table. Penilla was designing and knitting gorgeous clothes for Carolina's children, who are Penilla's grandchildren, and then Carolina's friends all started asking for the pattern so that they could knit these gorgeous designs for their own children. And after some convincing, Penilla agreed to start publishing her designs, and then over time they also included adult designs and they developed their own environmentally friendly yarn ranges to complement their designs. And now their business is very successful and they have a very beautiful shop in Copenhagen and that's where we did the interview. So Penilla and Carolina are smart, diligent women who have grown their business with some really sound business know-how. I found them really inspiring and delightful and I think you will too. Plus their designs and yarns are just simply stunning and it really was like heaven to visit their shop. And I think you'll find that the interview is a visual treat. Yeah, Mum and I went a bit wild in the Knitting for Olive shop and brought back lots of yarn for different designs that we fell in love with. We'll share all of that with you in Under Construction, along with a short duplicate stitch tutorial, a book review, and an exciting new Christmas project. So it's a very full program. Grab your favourite drink and get ready for 90 minutes of <laughs> knitting inspiration. Okay, now in the last episode, I interviewed Dario Tubiana, who's an Italian designer known for his intricate use of embroidery on hand knitted garments. <clears throat> now, even if you've only got a very vague interest in embroidery, I highly recommend watching that interview because Dario creates some really stunning, intricate picture designs on sweaters using intarsia and embroidery together. And it really is incredible to see what is possible to create with his skill level. So I'm knitting one of Dario's designs. It's a vest called Blue Lagoon Flowers. It's one of his more simple designs, but it's also using intarsia and embroidery or duplicate stitch, which is a form of embroidery. So here's a picture of the front and the back of the vest. I think it's really striking and I particularly love the bold retro flowers and the color combination that Dario's used. So you knit the vest in pieces and then you seam the front and back together with side seams. There's also intarsia flowers on the back of the vest, but I just chose to knit the back in plain blue with no flowers. And as I showed you in the last episode, the design uses a combination of intarsia and duplicate stitch. The large yellow and pink flower petals and the green leaves are all done in intarsia. And the shading in the flower petals of both flowers, that's the orange and purple parts, the centre of the flowers and the black outline around the centre of the flowers are all done in duplicate stitches. So if you haven't done a lot of intarsia before, doing some of the colour work with duplicate stitches is just a more straightforward and user-friendly solution. So before I talk more about what I've done and go into duplicate stitch a bit more, I want to remind you of the changes that I made to add waist shaping in the design. So the form of the vest is unisex and it has no waist shaping and I wanted to add some, but if I had done that without changing anything, I would have lost four stitches on the left petal of the bottom flower, which I think would destroy the image. So I brought the whole flower motif across to the right by four stitches and down by two rows. And I also made the upper green leaf a little bit smaller. And I did all of this just to ensure that there was going to be a big enough gap between the bottom flower's green leaf and the top flower's green leaf, just so that the placement of both flowers would still look balanced. And I'm happy to say that it did all work out well and I think I have successfully added waist shaping without destroying the balance of the images. 
So you've definitely noticed that my flowers are a lot more bling bling than in the original design <laughs> and that's because I've just gone crazy with glitter yarn and that all started because I was ordering lots of different glitter threads and yarns for another project which I'm going to show you later on in the pro program and they were all sitting right next to my vest on the table and Madeline walked by and had the bright idea that I should add some glitter highlights to the flowers. And I just thought, wow, that's a brilliant idea. And once I started, I really couldn't stop. So I really hope I haven't gone overboard. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. So what I've done here is I've gone for metallic threads. This is a gold metallic thread. And I duplicate stitched, if you can just hold it up a little bit higher, mm -hmm. over the center of this flower here. The original color was this mustard yellow. And I think it works okay. I think it looks okay. I think it looks good. Yeah. And then I used the same yarn but in a silver thread here to duplicate stitch over the white which is underneath it. This is this yarn here. And I have to say even though they are exactly the same yarn, this silver thread was just deteriorated as I was using it. It's a chain, it's a kind of chain thread and you can see here it just sort of unravels. And maybe that's okay if you're knitting with it but when you're using the same thread in embroidery and, and pulling it through all the time it experiences just, a lot of friction yeah, yeah it wears away and it was really awful mm. so I wouldn't <laughs> recommend um, embroidering with this with the silver one with <laughs> the gold was okay yeah. the gold surprisingly worked <laughs> yeah and then with all of the little uh, accents glitter accents here in copper I used this extremely fine copper thread and I held that four times with four thicknesses. It still didn't completely cover the width of the of the yarn, so it's just sort of adding little bits of copper sparkles to it. Yeah. So I hope, I really hope I haven't gone overboard. I know it is looking really bright and colourful. Someone said a little bit like a, a kindergarten teacher's <laughs> vest, but I don't mind being a kindergarten teacher. Um, I did, before I started, I did tell Dario of my plan to add glitter to his flowers and he said he highly approved of the idea, but that doesn't mean he highly approves of the result or how I've done it. But I do think it still will look good over a crisp white shirt and, and dark blue jeans. Yeah, look, overall I think it's fun and I still really love the idea of glitter. Personally, I might have gone to a shop where they had lots of different glittery yarns on display because I might have chosen slightly different colours, but overall I think it still works and it does look good with a white shirt. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, I'm very happy with it. <laughs> I've almost finished, just got this little uh, sleeve band to do so you'll see it finished in a fashion show in the next episode now if you've never done duplicate stitch before it really is so easy so I've put together a quick demonstration of me working on this vest just to give you some useful tips so that's coming up now <laughs> Duplicate stitch is also known as Swiss darning and it's a form of embroidery. You're tracing over existing knitted stitches with a strand of contrast yarn and this new strand of yarn should be the same yarn weight and type as the yarn that you're using in the original knitting. This is because you need to properly cover the original stitches and match the shape with your new stitches. This glitter yarn that I'm using won't completely cover over the white yarn, but I think in this case it's a good thing because it'll add to the effect that I want. With your needle, you enter from behind your work and come up through the base of the stitch. Then you take your needle and go from right to left under the two legs of the stitch right above. And then you go back down through the centre of the stitch at the same place where you originally entered. So you're following the path that the yarn takes in the original stitch. If you're only doing a single stitch, you can enter from the left or the right. It really doesn't matter which direction you take. But if you're doing a row of duplicate stitches, you need to insert your needle in the same direction that you're working the row. For example, here I am working the row from right to left, so I insert my needle from right to left. And likewise, when I work the row from left to right, I insert the needle from left to right. And this keeps the new yarn traveling in the same path that the original yarn traveled. If you don't do that, your stitches end up being crossed at the base and they look like twisted stitches and don't match the other stitches. 
When you're working vertically, you can enter your needle from either side, it doesn't matter. So now I'm working on the silver over the top of the white and I'm doing it in the, in the opposite direction. So I'm going from top to, to bottom. And when you're working in this direction, it's really important that you put your needle through both legs of the stitch above you. So not just the silver, but also the white. And that helps to keep your stitches looking really neat. So as Mum already mentioned in the intro, our feature interview is with Pernilla and Carolina, the mother-daughter team behind Knitting for Olive. Pernilla designs the knitting patterns and Carolina is in charge of marketing and sales, but together they've also developed their own yarn ranges and written a book which was translated into English earlier this year. And we have the book here. Um, so I'm actually knitting one of the patterns in this book called the Barbara blouse, which I showed you last episode. But before I get into the blouse, I thought I'd talk a bit more about the book itself. So it's a paperback and like most knitting books, it is a bit heavy. So you're probably not going to carry it around with you in your project bag, but it is a lovely book to have on your coffee table next to your knitting couch. Now, originally Knitting for Olive focused on children's patterns, but over time, Penelope expanded to adult garments, and this book contains 20 different patterns for adults only. So I'll give you a quick flick through the book now. The book starts with a lengthy introduction that tells the story and the inspiration behind Knitting for Olive. Then there's a section describing how they created their own yarn ranges and what their company values are. They try to be considerate of the environment, the animals, and also the people involved in the production of their yarns and designs. And because this book is for beginners and more advanced knitters, it also includes a brief explanation of some of the basic knitting terms and techniques. The patterns are mainly sweaters, but there's also some accessories like a hat, a neck warmer, and some more summary projects like the Chrysler top, and the Barbaro blouse, which I'm knitting. Many of these patterns are definitely beginner friendly. For example, the puff tee, the Carl Johan sweater, and Olive's vest, which is mainly stocking stitch. And if you're a little more advanced and you like doing some cables, I really like the knitted street of Copenhagen sweater, which is also quite oversized. Or you can practice knitting lace on the waffle sweater or the nature lace sweater. The lace and cable patterns include charts, which is really cool because I find I'm less likely to do mistakes with charts. And from a financial perspective, if you like five of these patterns, then you're already paying less for them by buying the book rather than buying the patterns individually. But apart from that, I do think this is just a really nice looking book. The paper's nice and the photography is very stylish. And I do think there's something a bit more romantic about browsing through a book when you're looking for new inspiration um, and a new project rather than scrolling through a website. But that's just me. Anyway, so I'm knitting one of these projects. It's called the Barbara Blouse, which I did show you last episode, but I'll show you a picture now to refresh your memory. It's a long sleeve top covered in a simple lace pattern that resembles seashells. It has set in sleeves, a short turtleneck, and a really pretty eyelet opening at the back fastened with three little buttons. It's very elegant and depending on what you combine it with, you can wear it casually, but also on more formal occasions. And I love this because I want to have more elegant knits in my wardrobe. So I'm using the recommended Knitting for Olive Merino yarn in the colorway Dusty Sea Green. I love wearing colorful clothes, just like mum, we're very similar. <laughs> Um, and what's great about this color is that it still counts as a color, but you can wear it as a neutral. So it's a bit different than beige or gray. Um, and that means that you can easily match it with many items in your wardrobe, or at least in mine. Yeah, so the pattern is designed with negative ease. For instance, I'm making the second size meant for a measurement or bust measurement of 83 to 91 centimeters, but the finished top will only measure 80 centimeters around the chest. And in my case, I think that's a negative ease of six centimeters. 
And actually, Mum's wearing the Barbara blouse in the upcoming interview in size two, so you can see what it looks like on her. I totally love this design, and I'm definitely knitting it as well. And yep. I'm going to knit it in this colour here, which is called blue tit, just like the the bird. Yeah, which is gorgeous. Yeah, so I'm I'm actually thinking that I was going to knit some other designs first, but I think I might knit mine along with yours. Because you're paving the way with me, you I now know just to follow your needle size, and I'll have the same gauge. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, you're in a bit of a blue craze at the moment, aren't I am. you? It is true. It used it's... to be green, and now it's blue. Yeah, this is this is a, a bluey green. Is yeah. it? Yeah. Right. Anyway, the recommended gauge for this pattern is 20 stitches over 40 rows for 10 square centimeters, using three millimeter needles. And this is my uh, gauge swatch. I did three by four pattern repeats on this, I think, and I'm not sure if you can really see the lace, but at first I was having some trouble figuring out where along the lace pattern I'm supposed to measure my stitch gauge. Because the rows all have different stitch counts, to create this shell shape you decrease every second row, meaning the last row in the pattern repeat has fewer stitches than the first row, and because you increase the stitch count again in the first row of the pattern repeat above that, this stretches the last row of the shell underneath to have the same width. And my problem was that I didn't know whether to measure my gauge in the first, the middle, or the last row of a pattern repeat. So mum suggested I just try measuring the first and the last row of the pattern repeat and then choose whatever seems most plausible, which is obviously the common sense solution. But I didn't think of it myself. Yeah, a lot of knitting is just common sense. Yeah. Just kind of think of it from another side, just in a really practical way. Maybe I'm missing common sense. <laughs> so my stitch gauge for 10 centimetres was 33 stitches on the first row and 20 stitches on the last row. So I concluded that you're supposed to measure the gauge on the last row. Then I measured my row gauge. The easiest way to do that is along the columns, and my row gauge is 20 rows for 5 centimetres, which also matches the recommended gauge of 40 rows for 10 centimetres. So that's brilliant. That means that your gauge is perfectly matching the recommended gauge. So once my gauge was sorted out, I cast on for the body. Up until the armholes, you knit the body in the round, and because this yarn is a fingering weight, you have to cast on a lot of stitches. And what helped me was to mark every hundred stitches with a stitch marker, so I didn't have as much trouble making sure that I had cast on the right amount. Anyway, I'm still working on the body, and... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't look like you've done much. It doesn't, but to my defense, or in my defense, um, I actually knitted further, but then I saw that I made a mistake, and so I had to rip back, which was really painful, especially because it's lace. And to do that, I'm just looking for the needles that I had. I can't find them, but I used a really fine pair of needles that I then tried to pick up the stitches with here before um, ripping back so that in the hopes of not having to pick up the stitches afterwards, because that's always a pain. Um, it worked okay, but I still had to pick up heaps of stitches. And the problem is that this is lace with quite a few decreases so often I would have to ladder up three rows that I dropped but part of that was involved uh, knitting two stitches together three rows down. That's why you need lifeline styles. Yeah but this time it wasn't really about having a lifetime I wouldn't have had a lifetime. Yes but no down. if you had a lifeline in you know what row you put that lifeline in. Oh, that's true okay? you, you use several then you rows. you rip it back yeah. and then you know okay now I'm back to row five of the pattern and yeah. you don't have to calculate the system, I've got the right stitches. Yes, you're right. And I should have <laughs> simply checked for mistakes more regularly, but as so often I get a bit lazy with that. Anyway, this body, which is still non-existent, does have waist shaping in it. And uh, so the seashells, I'll show you the, the um, gauge swatch again. These seashells, they get narrower as you go up to the waist, and that's how you shape the waist. The original design is actually cropped, but if you want to make the top longer, the pattern advises you to add an extra row of um, seashells around the waist area. I'm definitely doing that because I'm tall, and I also want to wear this top in winter, so it has to be a bit longer. And I'm even thinking of adding another row of seashells earlier on before you start the waist shaping, but I still idea. have to think about that because I don't want it to end up too long either. Yeah. Okay. Well, you do it and make the mistakes and then I'll learn from you. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll have less unpicking to do. 
So we filmed the interview with Knitting for Olive in their shop in Copenhagen and that means that we had the opportunity to browse through their many yarns afterwards. They have six different yarn ranges including merino which I showed you, cashmere, silk and a beautiful silk mohair blend. So their shop has all their beautiful shades of coloured yarn on display and it also has dozens of design samples that you can try on. And this is wonderful because we both found that you can pick up a design and it looks okay, but once you've tried it on and you see how it's supposed to sit on your body, yeah. you suddenly think it looks great and you want to knit it. Yes, that's why we chose so many designs because yeah. we put another one up and oh wow, this looks really good too. Yeah, so we had a lot of fun doing that and because we have such similar tastes in clothes, we now both want to knit the exact same designs and I, know. I was a bit concerned about that because I thought we've got a knitting podcast we have to sh show new projects yes but you think but ultimately but, you have to knit what you really love and what yeah. really inspires you there's no point and doing at least anything else we're using different colored yarn and yes, <laughs> it would be sad if we we're doing it in the same colour. But whoever starts first much. can figure out all the problems and then the other person just sails along behind them. Yeah, well, you just said you were about to cast on for that. So. Yes, you know what? I've almost finished this first. I'm I just, feel like you might be faster than me, which should be a maybe. bit embarrassing. I have just have to down in this end and I've finished the vest and then I might cast on for the Barbara brows while we're sitting here. It'll be a race. <laughs> anyway... I couldn't help myself in the end and I brought back enough yarn for three different projects. I know it's really extravagant, but here's all the yarn. Well, this isn't all the yarn, but these are all the colors. So I've got three sets. Um, this is the Merino yarn in Dusty Sea Green okay. that I showed you earlier for the Barbara blouse. Oops. And for the other projects, I'll be using a combination, I'll just take that, of merino and soft silk mohair, which is looking incredibly fluffy and lovely and luxurious. Um, Penilla and Carolina love coming up with very specific shades and variations of the same colors, which is why they have such a large assortment of colors. They talk about that in the interview as well, it's quite funny. And a lot of Penilla's designs use one strand of merino and one strand of soft silk mohair together, which is why they offer both of these yarn ranges in the exact same colors. And they also like to come up with names that describe the color really accurately. For example, this year is caramel, which doesn't seem like a big deal until you've seen all their other shades of brown, and then you see that they put some thought into it. I do think that caramel is a bit richer than this one. Uh, Not that richer, is. actually. It's a still a bit. neutral. It's warmer. It's, it's warm, got less yeah. grey in it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I still think it'll be neutral enough to go with lots of things in my wardrobe. You can see that's sort of my theme at the moment. <laughs> I've got too many colourful clothes. Um, and what I really like about the soft silk mohair version of this colour is that it has a subtle golden shimmer to it, or maybe yeah. a bronze shimmer, and that's because of how the silk takes the dye. I'm planning to knit this yarn into the fern sweater. It's covered in delicate lace and looks really feminine, and it also has a long turtleneck which will keep my neck and upper body warm in winter. And for my third project I'll also be combining one strand of merino and one strand of soft silk mohair, but this time in the colour pea shoots. Um, so again, I think they chose the name really accurately, this yeah. really does look like pea shoots. Um, and I'm thinking of knitting the Carl Johan sweater with this one. It's a simple stocking stitch sweater with a turtleneck and ribbing around the hem and the cuffs. The fit is loose with slightly puffed sleeves, giving it a more casual style. So usually I do choose designs with some sort of pattern on them, whether they be lace or cables, but because this green is so vibrant and beautiful, I don't think it requires lace or pattern to make the sweater an eye catcher, which is why I'm very happy to knit a simple design like the Carl Johan sweater. This is going exactly with your eyeshadow. I adore this colour as well, it's fantastic. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried you're going to want to snatch this jumper from yes. me. <laughs> Very likely. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about knitting for Oliver. Now it's time for you to meet Pinilla and Carolyn in part one of our interview with them. So enjoy the interview and we'll see you soon on the other side. Well, all right. Okay. You win. I'm in love with you. Well, all right. Okay. You win. Baby, what can I do? I'll do anything you say 
It's just got to be that way Well, all right Okay You win I'm in love with you Well, all right Okay You win Baby, what can I do? Anything you say I'll do As long as it's me and you All that I am asking All I want from you Just love me like I love you And it won't be hard to do Well, all right Okay You win I'm in love with you Well, all right Okay You win Baby, what can I do? I'll do anything you say. <laughs> It's just got to be Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm here with Penilla and Carolina Larsen, the mother-daughter team behind the Danish company Knitting for Olive. So Penilla and Carolina started their business in 2015 by selling online knitting patterns for babies and toddlers. They later expanded to offer patterns for children and adults, as well as a range of environmentally friendly yarns that perfectly complement their designs. So today we're filming this interview in their very beautiful shop in Copenhagen. And Penilla and Caroline, we're so thrilled to have you on Fruity Knitting. So thank you so much for inviting us here. Well, thank you for coming. We are thrilled as well. Yes. Let's start by you telling us the story behind Knitting for Olive, including what significant learning experiences and challenges you faced while building up the business. Okay. When we uh, started back in 2015, um, we were going to make a hobby project. We uh, had no experience in making uh, business. We had no experience in uh, making business plans. I was working full-time as um, in HR in a restaurant business, and uh, Caroline was full-time studying to become a midwife. So we, we, we had no knowledge about how to run a company or how to start a company, and everything we did, we had to do as we went along. I had my first grandson in 2013, and being a proud knitting grandmother, I would knit for him tons of different baby clothing and uh, Caroline would come home and she would say mom my girlfriends want the same as I have for my child <laughs> and uh, can you make a pattern and I said no I have no pattern writing skills I have been knitting all my life almost and I love knitting but I have no writing pattern skills at all so um, so that was the end of it and then two years later I had my second grandchild and history repeated Caroline would come home and she would say again, well, could you please try to make a pattern? And I said, well, okay, if I try to make a pattern, you will have to make a web shop. And then uh, we'll make a company and we'll try to do it correctly. And um, we'll have to find a name. And we pretty fast decided on an international name because we wanted to be able to show the designs at um, at Instagram and Facebook, mm -hmm. and since that was uh, had especially Instagram had an uh, international audience, it was important for us to have a a name that was international. So um, when we decided to make the name, we at that time I was only designing, or the plan was to design baby uh, clothing or, or toddler clothing uh, for my grandchildren, and at that time. Um, We, we, wanted the, we wanted to make sure that nobody got the impression that they could buy already-made knitwear. Mm -hmm. yes. So it had to be someone knitting for someone yes. else. It had to be obvious that it was hand-knitting. Yes. yes, and yes. someone had to do it for someone else since babies are unable to knit their own yeah. garments, right? <laughs> so um, so we, we chose uh, Knitting For, uh, and then we had to find out Knitting For Who. And um, when Caroline was pregnant, I would uh, say, well, maybe it's a little olive. And she said, no, it's not a little olive. And then she said, well, this time you can have your olive. And that's how it happened. Okay, that was your favorite name. And that you was my favorite name. Trying to impress on Caroline exactly. to name her name. Yes. She never had an olive. No. So now so, she could have an olive. Yeah. Yeah. So she said, well, now you can have your olive. Mm -hmm. And that's how it became Knitting for Olive. Uh, after that, we uh, we uh, did all the signing in, of, uh, making the company, signing, getting the, the, the Instagram and the Facebook uh, profiles made. So everything was ready for that. And uh, that was the uh, easy part. Now came the trying challenges. the challenges, yeah. right? I had to, to, uh, I had to make a pattern. So, so to start out with, I would just write down whatever I did. 
And that would be making one size, but I had to make more sizes and I had never done any pattern writing, so I didn't know how to grade a pattern. Um, but you I, did have a sewing background. Yeah, exactly. I have a long yeah. sewing background and, and uh, that helped me a lot, both with construction of the, the different the, uh, garments and the grading. Yeah. And then I tried out and we had uh, everything test knitted and it turned out well. So it, 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 it worked. And, uh, and the real challenge came when uh, I had to do the adult uh, grading later on. Yes, because mm -hmm. babies are pretty flat chested and exactly. very easy. Yes, <laughs> they grow a little here yeah. and a little there and yeah. that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, after me doing all the, 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 having the challenge with the patterns, while I was having the challenges with the patterns, uh, Kaolini was um, making sure that we had channels to, to present our uh, designs and to sell our designs. Yes. Yes, so I had to make a web shop and I had no experience in doing so. And um, so it was fairly easy actually to get started using a template, a simple template. But it became a challenge when we found out that knitters, they expect to get their patterns right away as a digital download. We didn't know that. So in the beginning, I would manually email them the pattern whenever I was online, and uh, that didn't work. <laughs> so, but since we, um, in the beginning, we decided we didn't want to spend money that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. So we had to expand little by little. So, so the business was paying for itself. Exactly, each step exactly, away. that's yeah. it. So yeah. we had to wait until we had sold enough pattern to pay for a more advanced web, sub web shop solution. And once that happened, we had sold a lot, a lot of patterns. We um, got the more uh, advanced um, web shop solution and we could send the pattern out automatically, um, <laughs> which was nice for our customers and also for me because it was a lot of work yeah, to add yeah. the, the pattern manually every yeah. time a, a yeah. customer bought a pattern. Yeah. So, uh, so that was what happened. We, uh, we upgraded or expanded little by little, step by step, all the way. Um, and so you didn't ever have to take out a financial loan? No, 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 no. we didn't do that. No, it's a really good business model. Yes. It, it worked well for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we liked it the, the old fashioned way. Yes. Yeah. And just very briefly, did you have um, a challenge also adjusting your pattern writing for an English speaking customer base? Yes, but that came uh, after Carolina started interacting on, on Instagram. Yes, exactly. Yes. 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 So we, we made an um, Instagram profile. And um, we had no plan. It was, uh, we, we started out as we liked. Um, I was very surprised to find a knitting community uh, where people spoke so positively about each other and helped each other out. Uh, it was a, a new world to me. Um, and really, I was really excited about <laughs> seeing this because yes. I wasn't a part of it before yeah. that. No. Yeah. yeah. So um, we had no plan. We took photos with our phone uh, mm -hmm. on the balcony. Uh, and we took photos that we liked. We had uh, we had no style, but uh, the balcony was like a wooden uh, floor, and uh, and it came to be very Scandinavian the look, and people liked it. So we we got more followers and uh, more customers, and we had uh, a, a demand on English pattern. So we thought, okay, not a problem. <laughs> we'll just translate our patterns into English, um, and so we did. We just translated our Danish pattern into English. But then we found out that's not what you do because a Danish pattern is very different than an English pattern. It's very simple. Yeah. Yes, the yes. Danish version. Yes. <laughs> the the international, uh, the English and American knitters, they expect a lot more details that we yes. didn't include in the in the Danish pattern. Mm -hmm. So, and it was funny actually because one day a customer wrote us an email said, "Oh, I bought this pattern from you. Uh, I, it's a gorgeous design. I really love it. But to be honest, the the pattern isn't really." good enough for an English knitter. Um, so you have, you have to do better on that. <laughs> and we were like, oh, okay, so, so how do we do that? Yeah. <laughs> and she was very helpful, actually, to, yeah. to tell us, well, you have to include US needle sizes. You have to include inches. A schematic. Stitch counts. Yes. Stitch, yes. Counts. Stitch, Stitch counts. counts. Yes. 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 And what about schematics? She said, yes. 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 Um, so, so every time you do a, a, a new thing, you have an instruction that you... You where the change, stitch count yeah. change, you have to say, okay, so that many stitches uh, are now increased and you have that many stitches yes, every yes. time you do something. And we didn't have that in the Danish pattern. No. So, uh, but we learned. And then thanks to the sweet customer, we, uh, <laughs> we learned how to write English patterns. And uh, now we have patterns in English as well. Yes. And then finally, how did it get onto yarn? 
Well, we um, <clears throat> when making the, the, the garments for the babies, I uh, looked for yarn at the yarn stores around Copenhagen, and uh, there were many types of beautiful yarn, but it wasn't exactly what we wanted. We wanted something that was uh, soft enough for to be directly on a baby's skin. We wanted 100% natural fibers. Uh, we didn't want the superwash, the least chemicals as possible, and um, and and we, we couldn't really find it. So we started looking and uh, decided that uh, we wanted to make our own yarn. And um, along the way of, of finding uh, the yarn we wanted, we found we got in contact with an Italian in, uh, spinning mill, and they had the most beautiful yarn, exactly what we wanted, and. Um, uh, we, uh, the thing was, they would only do yarn for machine knitting, and we needed yarn for hand knitting. So, like in any other situation in this company, we just asked, because you know, that's how you get along, yeah. is by asking. Yeah. And if they don't sell it, we'll ask them anyway. Yeah. So, <laughs> we, so we contacted the spinning mill, and they said, and, and told them that we really liked their yarn, and we would like to have it for, for hand knitting. And at that time, the owner was uh, a 90-year-old man, uh, and uh, when we asked for this and he heard about it, he got all sentimental, started, started thinking about his childhood and his grandmother hand knitting all the, through his growing up. And he said, of course we will make them hand knitting yarn. <laughs> so that's what happened. And now we have, uh, we have the yarn. That's mm -hmm. a really special story. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, many knitters really love to make gorgeous clothes for their children or particularly for their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But for the busy parents who have to look after and, and care for these hand knits, the functionality of a garment really has to take precedence over its beauty. Mm -hmm. So what features are you including in your designs that um, just in your baby and toddler designs particularly that – that make them both practical and beautiful? When I design the baby patterns, what's important to me is that, um, that they are practical, that they are uh, garments that are easy for the parents to dress the, the babies. It's, it has to be easy to change a diaper. It has to be easy to, uh, to um, get over the head. And uh, at the same time, the, the fitting is very important because it has to be... Um, it has to be fitted so that the baby can easily move without anything splitting or skin is showing. Uh, we don't want to sh have a diaper showing as well. Most importantly of all, for, to me, is that it has to be detailed. It has to be fun for me to create. And it has to be without any seams, if possible. Uh, I like to make the design so that the baby garments is one piece and uh, I was lucky to have my grandchildren next to me so I could, you know, fit it on them and see how are they moving, how are they crawling, where is it important to have a, a taller back piece or, or, or so on, and, um, and, and not having the seams for them to lay on. Yes. So they would get, you know, this tiny baby skin would get this <laughs> red line from laying on, on different seams. So, so that's how I... Um, that's, that, was that was the, the mainly in, your the, focus. Mainly in yeah. my focus, yes. And then a lot of, of, uh, of uh, baby garments were uh, stuck in sits knit and, and, and it would be not that detailed. And I like the details. I like it to be funny to, for the knitter to, and interesting to knit. And I want it to be interesting for me to, to do the math and make, uh, make everything fit. My sewing experience um, was very, very helpful when it came to, to, to do this because I could kind of see the sewing pattern in front of me and, and figure out, okay, if I increase here, I decrease there, I can kind of make them work together. 3D. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and, and doing the, the trying to avoid the seams, um, I had to use provisional cast on. Provisional cast on became my best friend because that way I could make uh, invisible seams when I sewed together the cast on with using kitchen stitch with the uh, finished product mm -hmm. and, uh, and it would just look uh, complete, which was nice to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the first um, garments you made for my first child uh, was these um, baby tights. <laughs> and um, they are very A simple. Gusset. Yes, but <laughs> super cute and super practical because whenever my baby was wearing these, he would always be well-dressed. Uh, no seams, no nothing from the from the 
type you buy yeah, with yeah, the with yeah. the uh, seam in the middle and on the back. So he would be well dressed uh, with the foot down here. There would be no socks falling off, so he would never be bare feet, which was really nice because yes. babies they kick their socks know, off all the time, and you always <laughs> like a sock, right? So um, so that was that was it. It was really simple. But then after making these, she had to make these the lace <laughs> version and yeah. have to make the lace work with the um, decreases and then she made these with small cables on them <laughs> and just one more pair the ripped more basic ripped uh, version of it gorgeous so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they turned into four different designs yes yeah the basic the basic wardrobe was important as well. It couldn't all be uh, ruffles and, yes. and uh, exactly. uh, lace and s stuff Filling like that. Bits, yeah. It had to be. But one of the things that was very popular that I made was uh, this uh, little um, tulip dress. The thing about this tulip dress is that it has, um, first of all, it has the lace skirt that I like. It's knitted from the bottom up and has a nice little etching, which is similar on the sleeves. Uh, this skirt has an A shape and the, the decreases are incorporated in the lace pattern so there is no cutting of, of, uh, of the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the lace So it's uh, done pattern. in the round and it's, it's just mm -hmm. exactly. and shapes, it, it, naturally. It shapes naturally into the, the, yeah, through mm -hmm. the waist. Perfect. Yeah. But and babies then, don't have waist. No, yeah. they don't. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> and yeah. then um, in, in order to, when, when babies are crawling, mm -hmm. a skirt would kind of come up yeah, and you would be able to see the the diaper or whatever uh, bloomers yeah. was underneath. But to avoid that and to make it a whole piece, a whole suit, I made it. I made this um, the rumba underneath that was attached with the skirt before the sleeves and the top were were okay. added on. Yeah, and of course this would have easy access for diaper changing. Yes. so I would add the button uh, part between the legs. Mm -hmm. This was very popular uh, mm -hmm. for, for little girl mothers. I can see that. Mm -hmm. And again, for, for making the the, um, the, de the decreases. Uh, and the raglan the, shaping. And the raglan shaping, yes. I ended up making the eye cord uh, trimming at the, yes. the, um, at the neckline to pick up. You know, so that everything detail. would kind yeah. of fit together into to one piece. It's very mm -hmm. stylish, very beautiful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another dress that you made, another lace dress was this one. Our holly dress, which is an all lace dress, um, worked also from the bottom down. It has a picot-like edge, but it's actually not. It's uh, it's like small bells or bubbles that we have used or Panilla used for the for the edge. So this was one of our Christmas dresses, um, which was actually a funny story because we made one Christmas dress one year. And then the next year in October or November, mm -hmm. a customer said, so when is the Christmas yeah, dress coming this year? <laughs> <laughs> Christmas dress? Are we supposed to make a Christmas dress? And so we were, so we had to uh, hurry up and make a Christmas dress. And ever since we made, um, each year we made a new dress. So this yes. was one of them. So we wanted it to be very um, festive um, and elegant, uh, suitable for, for Christmas Eve. So it has, it's an, it's an all lace skirt and um, it has a, a pin tuck. Uh, here between the the skirt and the yoke, and um, the the decreases are worked in the pattern as well here. Yes, so the raglan is very uh, yeah neat, neat yeah. looking, uh, and um, that was when it working with her. I know what she liked and what was also a challenge, of course. But this this was the kind of work that she really enjoyed. Like I don't want to have a a stuck in a stitch yoke, which would be very easy for mm. this compared mm. to using mm. the the lace up here. But she wanted it to work so. No matter what, she mm. had to figure out how to do. So, and she did. So she ha she has this, or we have this uh, um, nice raglan. Plus, I don't want to have stocking stitch snitch going along the the exactly. raglan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's very it had to be all uh -huh. lace, which which makes it really ele elegant. Yeah. Um, and we have this the same etching on the sleeves as well, and the eye cord, um, which kind of matches also the pin tuck. And, uh, and gives it a, a very very beautiful. Nice okay, design. what's next? Mm -hmm. Well, what? so next actually we have this one. It's a cardigan, uh, Audrey cardigan. Maybe you need this as well. Yeah, exactly, okay. because this was designed to be worn on top of dresses. So Gorgeous. we what an elegant little Christmas baby. <laughs> exactly right. So this one would go like uh, on top of this, 
Uh, it was made because my brother was getting married and uh, my daughter, she had to attend to the wedding as a flower girl walking down the aisle. And Penilla made a dress for her to wear. Um, but the problem is that the summers in Denmark aren't always very warm. Yeah. So we would need to make sure that she had something she could wear on top of the dress. But we didn't want the dress to be uh, hidden uh, behind the sweater. So what Penilla did was uh, this cardigan, uh, which is open um, but closed at the same time. Uh, you, you tie with the bow up here. But it still leaves room for the yoke to be uh, Same, fully dress, visible, yes. yeah, on yeah. the dress, mm-hmm. on the dress exactly. It has little puff sleeves. It has mm-hmm. small puff sleeves, and it's uh, slightly A-shaped, um, which makes sure makes sure that the the skirt there's room for the skirt, yeah, um, which was also important. So um, it's very simple with the i cord edges. Uh, it's just a, an elegant um, detail, but it's very simple because the focus should still be on the dress with all the lacing details. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so that's the story of this cardigan. Mm-hmm. Totally stunning. I'm, I can't wait to Madeline has children. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No pressure. <laughs> so what's, what's next? Well, then? next is um, we chose to show you these. Uh, these are uh, these are our baby bear bonnets, and they have been extremely popular. Uh, they were fun to make. They are a um, one-night project, if you're a fairly... <laughs> experienced knitter it's very nice to make these and this the thing about making these was that um, the fun part was first of all you start a lot around the face and um, and in in in, uh, in order to make it work so that I had uh, the increases come up until to the ear part make increases enough to make the ear stand out like this then again make decreases on the other side of the of the um, ear and um, and finally, how figure out how to make it uh, make the, the both sides meet mid back or center back without sewing them together. So everything here is knitted into one piece as well. So there are no seams for little heads to lay on, and um, and they are just very 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 popular. These are two different types of yarn. This one is the merino with the cashmere. Mm-hmm. And this is the merino with the mohair. And the merino with the mohair gives it the little furry look. So so it's like a little bear. But a lot of mothers, they they don't appreciate having furry yarn too close to the face. Yeah. So when we made the pattern, um, there is a suggestion on how to use a double merino for the trimming around the face. Ah. And then add the mohair mm-hmm. For the back part of the that's of really the, clever. I was just, just thinking that because yeah. I think mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. that's actually what we have here. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's this one here, so, I'll just show. Uh-huh. Yes. Because so real fast, there was a dem- there are many demands from the <laughs> <laughs> and one uh, was, can we have this for for bigger children to to wear? And uh, they wanted it as a, a balaclava, which was a good idea because then you avoid having a scarf on. Yes. In Denmark, you're not allowed to have uh, loose scarves when you go to kindergarten. That okay. can you know you can yeah. pull it. So you have to have something that sits around the neck, like um, like a neck piece. So I had to turn the little uh, the little uh, bonnet into a, a balaclava, and to do this. I would have it was it was fun work again because now I had to to make the 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 front part curve around the bottom of the chin okay yes. like this by doing short rows uh, in different ways here to make that happen if uh, if uh, provisional cast on is my best friend short row is my second, second best friend <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because that makes everything possible yes i am just seeing the lovely details in this and i'm thinking that these are such great little fast projects to learn a whole lot of new techniques on yes you know you can mm-hmm. really experiment and get them just get accustomed to doing these techniques on small projects yes that's brilliant. Okay. Plus, you, for these, you don't hardly use any yarn, so you can use your leftovers as well, which yeah. is very nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and yeah, this, everything has always an addition. Uh, so the, the little uh, baby bear bonnet turned into a, a baby bear suit. <coughs> so we have the little ears here and we have the feet. So this is for, um, in Denmark, you, the, the babies sleep outside in their carriage yeah. uh, all year round. Yes. So it's always nice to have something to, tuck them into when they yeah. uh, when they sleep outside so, so this was, uh, was <laughs> nice mm-hmm. okay great mm-hmm. have we got anything else that you want to show yes we do um mm-hmm. let's put yes. this aside mm-hmm. 
So this is another um, jumpsuit, which is um, it, it's this is where um, aesthetics and uh, practicalities they meet. Um, it it's worked from the bottom down, and it has this little lace uh, edge. Um, then it has a, a wide um, a diaper uh, or change, yes. yeah, yeah, opening like uh, opening for for diaper changing. Yes. Uh, because it has to be practical, but the lace is worked in the round, and it's not open to avoid small flaps in the lace. Yes. yes. So yes. it's a, a small detail, but it's it's it makes a lot of difference. Not having a button down here yes. and the flaps yes. uh, at the at the cuffs. It's a stuck in its stitch um, body, Probably, yeah. mm -hmm. and then it has this wide um, color attached to it, which is the same as the. The cuff uh, edge just wider. Yeah, that's and beautiful. Uh, it has the eye cord edges as well. And natural decreases are happening yes. inside exactly. of the design. Exactly. Yes, so yes. exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is the the uh, main focus of the yes. suit, I guess. Right. It's very beautiful. Um, yeah, and it has and a, a slit. Uh, yeah, at the back. This is uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, little here. Yeah. Just a, a tiny little slit. Yeah. Totally gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. and these are more of the construction work. Um, when I when I um, when I found a certain lace pattern that I would like to to add on to a sweater or a dress or something, I had to work out how to turn it the correct way so that both sleeves would have the the um, the lace the turning the same way. Yes. If I, if, because if I started here and went along to the second sleeve, this would turn the, the other way around. So it has to be so mirror image. It, exactly. So so what I did at, at this uh, blueberry blouse was that I um, I started with uh, provisional cast on, again, mid front, and then I would knit a piece up till here. Then I would start on the back, mid back, and do the same mm -hmm. uh, piece. And then knit them together and continue into a sleeve pick up stitches from the provisional cast on and do the same thing but mm -hmm. reverse on the other side and in, in uh, when doing that i was able to get the to get the the lace well the lace is sometimes dictating how i have to do the construction yes because if if it has a right and a wrong way i have to figure out how to do that and that's the, the fun challenge about doing this i really really like it so, totally so that gorgeous. was uh, that was one way of doing it. This is another one where I, I really like the um, this is the leaf tunic. I like the leaf pattern, and in order to get that at the end of the at the at the bottom of the the, the body piece, I would have to knit it sideways, and then I did a lot of uh, a lot of German uh, short rows yes. here to add more width to the to the body to make it and also to make it this, this a line. shape. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then at the same time, um, the same time I would have to have it narrow up here so it would fit the shoulder parts. So it's actually knitted from one side, and then the front piece, and then the back piece, and then it's just sewn together with kitchener stitch with the with the, again the provisional cast on. And I picked up uh, stitches for for sleeve work, and made the sleeves at the end. It's so, so that's elegant. another. Um, yeah. Where where the, the 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 lace is actually determining how I do the the pattern. Totally mm -hmm. gorgeous designs. Now I just mm -hmm. want the viewers to see a few more because they're all so adorable. So why don't you pass me these? I'll hold them, mm -hmm. and you can both Oops. say something very quickly about each one, so the viewers can see as many as possible. Okay, this is our flower dress. It's knitted sideways as well, and it has these little flowers where that are crocheted and added on at the end of. Uh, of the project. Totally there gorgeous. We, yes. This is our bean sprout rumba, which is uh, was fun to make. Of course, this was the fun part to make. It's not lace and it's not really cable. I don't know what you call it, but it was interesting to make and it makes a difference to the to the rumba. This is our our daisy blouse. And this one has uh, the, the, mid, the center part of the flowers is knitted on. And uh, afterwards, you would have to embroider the the, the, the little petals. flower petals. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And this is called Daisy, which is the same name as my granddaughter. I have a Daisy granddaughter, <laughs> so that's very nice. She was a lucky sweater. girl. She was yes. lucky. Yes. This one is just uh, stocking stitch knit, but 
it's never just stuck in stitch niche because it has to make it interesting. And uh, there is this um, uh, design in the, uh, at the yoke and it has uh, a different design for each size so that you don't cut into the, the, motives. the motives when you make different okay. sizes. That's so, also gorgeous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. The little button there on the side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one is our rhubarb uh, wrap for babies. Very popular and it's uh, made in our merino and it shows the, the, the lace pattern really well. It's a cute little... It's adorable. Uh, yes. <laughs> so this is the rhubarb, that's the leaf. Exactly. Yes, yes. exactly. Exactly. Very cute. That's how it's... Mm -hmm. Okay, now yeah, here, here, this is our lace bad dress and uh, the thing about making this was uh, when you want to make a, a ruffled edge like this uh, on a sleeve and using the lace pattern you have to start at the end of the sleeve to and work up so this one is worked from the sleeves up and then the yoke is knitted and then again when I cast it on here I would use the personal cast on and knit the skirt down from top down so that's another that you get through a lot of different techniques when you uh, when you make a, a tiny dress Absolutely. like that. Absolutely, mm -hmm. they're, they're great and little learning lessons. Yes, mm -hmm. this is a skirt actually. It's called um, it's called uh, beads on a string skirt, and um, because of the little beads, it's nice and to make it. it you know when when uh, the the girls will turn around, the the skirt will flare out, flare out <laughs> yeah, which they really like. You can use leftover yarns for the little details. And then as all the other uh, pants and, and uh, skirts, it's taller on the back part. You can see here has a tiny bit of, of, of uh, rose or pink. And you have a, bright, uh, uh, a broader piece here to make it taller in the back. That's so, mm -hmm. these details just make it so special. So and also if they're wearing a, a diaper, it just exactly, covers. Yes. Exactly, it covers, yes. This is uh, a robin dress and uh, Roxy. a Sorry. Roxy. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. fine. Roxy. Yeah. So many Roxy <laughs> dress. And here the, the detail work is, is in the yoke. It was just fun to make. I have um, uh, worked out a technique where you don't have to turn the the um, the work while making the bubbles. You oh, can just do it. Excellent. Yes, like doing eye courts. Excellent. That's another little detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is our UNICEF sweater. When I made this for my granddaughter, um, it didn't have a name and then Carolina would show it on Instagram and uh, one of our followers would say, oh, it looks like the UNICEF uh, logo. So we contacted UNICEF and asked them or told them that we would like to donate our sales, total sales from all of our UNICEF designs, which is a very nice little feature. Totally. Mm -hmm. And then this one. Oh, we love this one. <laughs> and this is the blue tit sweater. I made this for my grandson. He is uh, almost two years old. And his favorite animal in the world is a blue tit. So he had to have a blue tit sweater. And Lucky he loves grandchildren. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> they, they are my motivation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's nice. Well, all right. Okay. You win. I'm in love with you. Well, all right. Okay. You win. Baby, one thing more. If you're going to be my man, sweet baby. So welcome back. Guess what? I've finished my vest in that time. Here it is. I just need to block it. <laughs> well done. Very exciting. And now I'm casting on for the Barbro blouse. <laughs> so I'm going to catch up to you. I know. No, I'm so, in so inspired. If there's bets, then I'm betting you're going to be finished before me. <sighs> Maybe. Maybe I'll just egg you on. <laughs> and it'll be a little competition, a mini competition. Yeah. <laughs> so that was part one of our interview with Knitting for Olive. And in part two, we show you a selection of the adult designs and we fully explore their gorgeous yarn ranges. And on the Knitting for Olive website, they offer suggestions on how to color match their yarns so that you can create new nuances or shades of the same color, which is really interesting and exciting. So in part two, Carolina also talks us through some different combinations and she demonstrates what works really well together and I think also what's important she demonstrates what doesn't work so well together and why it doesn't work so well I think that's valuable information so part two of the interview is coming up pretty soon at the end of the program and Knitting for Olive is generously offering a 15% discount to Fruity Knitting patrons on all their yarns and patterns in their online store and with over 160 patterns for babies children and adults and a variety of 80 colors for all their yarns, I think that's a fantastic opportunity. So a very big thank you to Penilla and Carolina for this generous offer. 
So if you've watched our show before, you'll know that we have a Patreon page. Patreon is a crowdfunding platform that allows fans to financially support their favourite creators, which includes, of course, YouTube channels like our own. This is our Patreon page. Recently, Patreon has added several new features to its platform to make it more user-friendly. For example, if you go to Collections, our posts are now categorised by topic. So, if you want to listen to previous Fruity Knitting Live events, you'll find them here. And if you want to use a patron discount, you'll find it under this collection here. So this is both of our full-time work and we also carry significant expenses and therefore we rely entirely on the financial support from our viewers through Patreon to continue creating interesting interviews and engaging knitting related content for you all. So if you enjoy the show and you want to enable us to keep producing it, please become a patron. We've named the levels of support after different sheep breeds so you have the choice of becoming a Hebridean a Merino or a Shetland patron, and we greatly appreciate your support. On that note, we also host a Fruity Knitting Live event, which happens monthly, and we always have a special guest on it that we've previously interviewed on the show. Our Shetland patrons get to attend these events live online and also have a chat with the guest, and both Shetland and Merino patrons can also listen to the event as an audio recording at a later date. Our next live event guest will be the Canadian actor, knitter and textile artist Kirk Dunn. We interviewed Kirk in episode 136 while he was touring Austria and Germany with his one-man play called The Knitting Pilgrim. The play recounts Kirk's 15-year artistic and spiritual journey of hand-knitting three huge panels that look like massive stained glass windows. So Kirk is quite an unusual guest and this live event should be really interesting. It will be held on the 2nd of December. You can leave your questions for Kirk and find all the event details on our Patreon page under the collection called Upcoming Events. And we're also really excited to announce that starting in December, we will be hosting an additional monthly knit and chat live event for our Shetland patrons. So the idea is to create a fun space for our Shetland patrons to regularly meet and get to know each other. You'll be able to share your progress on your latest knitting project and ask the group knitting related questions. And these knit and chat sessions are just very relaxed, informal and a lot of fun. So our Shetland patrons now have two live events available for them every month. One with a special guest who we have interviewed and featured on the show and an informal knit and chat session with Madeline and I. So we are really looking forward to spending more time with you, getting to know you better, and we hope to see lots of you there. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. So Christmas is now coming up very, very soon, yeah. and Madeline and I are going to spend Christmas with a family in northern Germany. And as a gift to this family, I'm going to knit a special Christmas snowflake angel, and it's a design by Alan Dart, who's a UK designer. And we have a feature interview with Alan Dart in episode 118, Alan is one of the most best known, most talented and experienced toy designers in the UK because he's been designing toys for over 30 years, bringing out new designs every week for the Women's Weekly and Simply Knitting magazines. He lives in the beautiful county of Cumbria in the UK and he's now in semi-retirement, although he still is designing. And his fantastic attention to detail really makes his toys just beautiful and unique. We've shown a wide variety of designers and yarn producers on Fruity Knitting, but like everybody else, we also have our own individual favourites for whatever reason. Mm. And for me, I think as far as toy designers go, Alan Dart has to be my favourite designer. I had absolutely no interest in knitting any toys until I came across his designs. I think his characters, I just love the style of his characters and I love the meticulous detail that he puts in each little character. They're a lot 
less like toys you want to knit up and give to a child to play with and more like little characters that you want to knit up and put in different corners of your home just as ornaments or just to put a smile on your face every morning. <laughs> and what's really sweet is that you can also see that if you go back to the interview, Alan always has a backstory to each character that he makes and they're always very cute yes. and fun. Yeah, he's yeah. very passionate about his designs. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I wanted to give our new viewers just a, a, real, a little uh, rundown of what we've done so far because we have both knitted a few of his designs and I hope our long-term viewers don't mind a recap as well. It all started with this design here, which is Outback Aussie, an Australian koala, wearing his Akubra hat. And I thought you might enjoy seeing an original Akubra hat. Akubra hats, uh, well, Akubra is a brand, but Akubra hats are the Australian cowboy hats. Yeah. And I think they're made of felted rabbit fur. Okay, I don't yeah. know. But you picked that up when you went back to Australia. That's when you right. Were... I spent half a year in Australia after high school. Yeah. Um, and I wore this everywhere. And I tried wearing it in Germany, but people looked at me weird. And <laughs> at some point I gave up. <laughs> They're not quite used to Akubra hats. Yeah. Anyway, true Akubra hats um, also have, or maybe not true ones. That's but not they, true, yeah. <laughs> they have corkscrews to some keep the do, flies yeah. away. Yeah. So he's looking very Australian. This was actually knitted for us by one of our dear Australian patrons and she sent it over in a box of goodies that also had some Tim Tams and oh, Cherry yes. Ripes and I think also some Vegemite. The box made us so homesick but it was really gorgeous and, and Outback Aussie really inspired me to get cracking and knit a design for myself. So can you hold him? Yep. So the one I picked was this one here which is called Nest of Birds and it's a blue tit feeding her baby chicks and she's got a little piece of of yarn in her mouth in her beak to resemble a worm is that a blue tit yes it's a blue tit i thought they were I blue checked. yes i know well oh. this is a, a green blue tit okay <laughs> anyway so her baby chicks they all come out they've got their mouths open and she's sitting perched on the nest here with a little bit of velcro under her bum and I found this to be a surprisingly quick knit and the, the pattern was really so meticulously well written that I promptly bought another design to knit as a Christmas <laughs> present. This was last year and I have since given away this present so I can only show you a photo. So here it is, it's Count Dracula and he's totally gorgeous. Dracula is very formally dressed in a white tie dress suit. He has a white bow tie worn around a standing wing collar his black cape has a blood red lining and under the cape he's wearing an evening tail coat, high waisted pants, a wine red waistcoat and black court shoes. And Dracula's little bat companion is also really adorable and I just have to smile whenever I look at them together. So I'm making a knitted chess set, also by Alan Dard. I did have a break from it for a few months, but I'm really excited about finishing it and then finally playing some games of chess with it with my friends. I've completed all of the high-ranking chess pieces, and now I'm just working on the pawns. So for the white pieces, I chose to use pastel colours, and the black pieces are wearing dark and smouldering colours. And as you can see, they all have such fine details on them that it's just a lot of fun to make them come alive, especially when you start playing with the colours as well. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the design I'm working on, the Christmas Snowflake mm. Angel. So here she is and I think she's really beautiful. Without a halo she stands at 38 centimetres or 15 inches, so she's quite a big angel. And I particularly like her wings and her hair and the little dove that's resting in the cup of her hands. So that's why I've been buying all this glitter yarn and I've got quite a collection now. So Alan designed this angel over 20 years ago. So the yarn that he used for her feathery feathers and her, and her dress is discontinued. But I did find a perfect substitute here. This is the Shachan Meyer Baby Smiles Lenya Soft Maxi. So I'm going to use this for her feathers. And while I was looking for this yarn, I came across this crazy yarn here. <laughs> this is called Creative Bubble and it's by Rico Design. It's a disco yarn because it sort of glitters around. 
and I had the idea that I could knit the skirt of her dress in this disco color, the <laughs> disco shiny yarn, and also the feathery collar and cuffs of, on the bodice of her dress in this, and I think she's going to look pretty groovy. And I sort of think that a top made out of this stuff would look groovy. It'd probably be incredibly uncomfortable because yeah. it's all plastic. It's very itchy. But imagine going to the club with it. That'd be pretty cool. You never go to clubs. <laughs> you might, might start. start. <laughs> but you could do some highlights in it or some intarsia in this yeah. maybe but could look funny okay so this is what I've done so far I'll show you very quickly so this is her skirt it's very unpleasant to knit with I have to tell you but um so that's Beauty her skirt that there and here are her wings this is what they look like and then you're going to fold them together like this and do you stuff them yes of course okay. you have to stuff them to make them a bit uh stiff so I've done, I think I've done all the pieces. I think this is her head and here's an arm and another arm and a, bod and a bodice. And I think there's a couple of feet here. She has bare feet like all angels ah. and a head and um, a, a other few bits and pieces <laughs> which are kind of getting all tangled up here. It is really hard to imagine that all these weird little pieces are gonna transform into a beautiful angel. But I have known from experience that all you have to do is meticulously follow the pattern, mm. step by step in blind faith, and it all turns out perfectly in the end. So I am planning to film myself assembling this angel and show you in the next episode. And I really hope she's looking stunning in all her disco glitter. <laughs> disco glitter glory. Yeah. So now it's time for Madeline and I to say goodbye to you because it's part two of our interview with Knitting for Olive. And we're going to see you very soon in December. Yes, have fun with the interview and thank you very much for spending time with us. Bye. Bye. Well, all right. Okay. You win. I'm in love with you. Well, all right. Okay. You win. Baby, what can I do? I'll do anything you say. It's just got to be. So as you will see, we're each wearing a Knitting for Olive adult garment. So how did you, your expansion into designing adult garments happen? Can you just say something briefly about all the garments mm -hmm. we're wearing and also show some other designs yes. and maybe also talk about any changes that you had to make to your design style? Yes. So um, getting into adult size, uh, size designing was um, Instagram and a uh, high demand on Instagram that uh, made us do that. Uh, I had to convince her. So I asked several times, uh, would you want to do a doll size style? And no, I don't. But eventually she gave in. And um, I saw through Instagram how a lot of people wanted the, the, our uh, designs for children in an adult size. And um, also we could see that a lot of knitters were starting to choose to knit for themselves instead of their children or grandchildren. So it gave, uh, it was, it, it, it made, it made sense. sense. Yeah, yeah, it made sense to start uh, Designing for adults. Uh, we wanted a, a timeless and classic... Um, Aesthetic. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Uh, because we wanted it to be something that the knitters could wear for a long time. Uh, it wasn't fashion-driven. It wasn't something that we wanted the knitters to, to change out every season. Yes. So uh, we wanted something that could be used for long. Since you put mm. a lot of time and effort into knitting a, a sweater yeah. or whatever it yeah. is. So that was the, our goal. Um, she had the uh, grading challenge for uh, n making designs for women. Uh, we include sizes from extra small to uh, 4XL. Uh, 150 centimeter is the largest size. So um, she had to learn something new. Okay. <laughs> that was and... a big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest challenge of all, I think, to, to, um, to, to uh, fit different body sizes and fit forms different forms of yes. bodies so but it was it was um it was nice and i was so relieved when it worked out so so that was a nice uh, a nice challenge making in, uh, more sizes so when i started um doing the adults uh, the signs some of them are classic uh, yeah. or, or very uh, basic classic, basic basic, yeah. basic <laughs> is like more the word yeah so i for instance i made this turtleneck which is a classic turtleneck it has um it has a, a, sh a saddle yeah. shoulder, and um, and it has a, a broader 
uh, ribbing on the edges to make it more elegant. So it has a tiny bit of of uh, blue blues on shaping yes, here, with and the, then yeah, with the, that's with, lovely, which was um, was very popular as well. And uh, after making this, I had to do some lace work. <laughs> I thought that um, why not do the classic turtleneck, but add the lace. So this is what I did. At, and at, on this uh, design, I had to make a circular um, knitted uh, yoke and, and make the, the pattern expand with the, with the um, increases. increases, yes, to make uh, room for the sleeves and, yes. and everything here. And, but still, I, I, uh, I kept the, the turtleneck the etching as on the, uh, the classic turtleneck. This so this is, is just, just a, a more feminine and a more, more elegant yes. um, yeah. uh, design. It's, I love it. It's definitely one that I think I'm going to knit. And mm. it, like you said, it's very neat the way you've incorporated the mm. increases inside the lace pattern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what comes next? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we have another lace. Another lace sweater is our waffle sweater. Um, it's uh, all lace with uh, ribbing edges as well. It's uh, higher uh, on the back um, to shape the neck, and the short rows are worked in um, lace. The lace pattern written out. Lace That's really pattern. clever. Yes. So you're avoiding any extra stocking stitch exactly. or anything. Exactly. Yes. Yes. You can mm -hmm. see. Yeah. And so, so the lace um, is identical uh, on the front and the sleeves in the back. So you can see how the the lace kind of meets. Yes. Um, in the red That's good. Very um, neat with mm -hmm. the stocking stitch yeah. and then the lace panels yeah. made them together. And this is a uh, um, three strands of our mohair held together. Uh, so it's a little different. With a very, it's very light. Uh, a lot of people say it's like wearing a cloud yeah. because yes. it's, it's, it's super soft and, and fluffy. And fluffy. Yeah, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, gorgeous. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Next we one. have this one, which is also uh, a lace um, sweater or cardigan. Um, lace and chunky knit taken to the next level, which is a, a 10 millimeter needle. Wow. <laughs> very chunky uh, yarn. Yeah. That's a very quick knit. Yeah, a quick knit, exactly. Um, lace pattern, um, also shaping in the back and uh, ripped edges. So it has uh, the lace and the the bulkiness of the yarn makes a good contrast. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's it's a relaxed sweater while still a lace, lace yes. pattern. That's a great combination. Yes, yes. it mm -hmm. is. I love it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when I'm after making this, Carolina said, well, isn't it time for you to make something lace, lace, like small needles? And I did. I made this one that Andrea is wearing today. It's the Barbro uh, blouse and uh, it's all lace. Uh, it's uh, it starts from the bottom and you knit it up and in order to get the the the, um, the, the little waves the, yeah, the little wavy yeah. edge here you have to add more stitches uh, when you start and then you can decrease going up. Uh, this one is the only pattern we have with a sewn on sleeve and uh, I had to do that because of. The, the close fit. Yes. It's important that when you make something in a close fit that you have a nice shoulder line. And that's where my sewing experience came yes. through again because yeah. of this. Then uh, the stitches for the, for the, uh, the neck uh, piece is um, picked up but continued from the body pattern. So it's again seamless. So it's, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so it's seamless. It's... On the back, it has uh, three little buttons. Uh, that closes the slit that is in the middle yeah, of the... and this the eye here. drop uh, hole here is very yes. elegant. So, so yes, that's I, nice. I love this design and I'm definitely going to be making it. And that's in the Knitting for Olive Merino. Yes. Yeah. One strand and uh, three millimeter needles. Very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. that's great. And is that another variation? That's the summer variation we made this year. We made it into a top. This has uh, eye coat etching and the body part here is the same. So this is um, very neat and you... You don't have to make the, 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 sleeve. the sleeve works with all the, the, the lace so, fitted. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one last design. Let's one quickly last. talk yes, about we this talk one. about this. This is our yoga top. And the yoga top is a wrap top. And it has been very, very, very fun to make. Because you, I, I started... The, um, it's made of, of a left and a right piece and, uh, and sewn together center back. So you go sideways, but then when uh, adding on stitches here or decreases... No, increases, 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 increases yeah. yes. In the in the ribbing pattern, it starts to move upwards as well. Yes. So um, this is how you with uh, increases uh, can, um, can can shape. 
and, they, and they're you a design want. feature. Yes, mm -hmm. and then it has the I code etching and the high, the uh, I code uh, for the for the tie string. Tie string. Mm -hmm. So they're all really really mm -hmm. gorgeous. You've definitely got a talent for designing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now mm -hmm. as you said earlier, shortly after starting your business, you developed your first yarn, which is this one, the knitting for olive merino. And since then, you've added more yarn ranges to your collection. So what was important to you when you were developing these yarns? And let's see all of the yarns. When we started making our own yarn, we, uh, we started making the merino yarn. We wanted, of course, the natural fibers, and uh, we had found this perfect yarn. And now the challenge was to figure out how would we want the weight of the yarn? How uh, would we like the, the gauge to be? What needle size? So we had a, uh, a dialogue with the spinning mill going back and forth that they would send us samples. I would try to knit and they would, I would comment and they would send another sample. And we ended up with this, uh, with this type of, of, uh, of merino. It is uh, three ply, but each of the plies is made out of two strands of wool. Which is uh, which, which is which makes it uh, good for uh, for not peeling because it's yes. a very soft wool. Merino wool is a very soft wool, yeah. and it can easily peel. Mm. So this way we will uh, avoid the peeling. We love yarns that don't peel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it has to be long lasting. Yes, right for baby wear. So, yes, and when we make when making making uh, the yarn, we uh, made a plan. We actually made a plan for once. The plan was to make the merino wool. No artificial fibers, only natural, no superwash, very soft, everything was in order. And then we would make uh, six natural colors, a baby blue and a baby rose. And that was it. And uh, that went well. Mm -hmm. we, uh, when we, as soon as we got the, the, um, the first eight colors, the plan lasted for about two minutes. And then we said, okay, we need more colors. This is nice. We need more colors. And uh, after a short while, we decided we, need, uh, we needed other types of yarn as well. We, uh, we live in a country at four seasons. And um, living with four seasons means different kinds of yarn for different kinds of seasons. And um, in the, the good thing about making your own yarn is that when we, when we did this, we could make the gauge fit in the different types of yarn. So when, uh, if you bought one of our patterns, for instance, a dress pattern, you could, you could knit it wearing the merino wool for mm -hmm. winter. And then you could use the same pattern for using, for instance, the, 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 the cotton, cotton blend. Yes, yeah. the cotton blend or even the silk would, uh, would make the same gauge, so you could use the same patterns. And so that was really a nice future about making your own yes. yarn. Yeah, yeah. so the first um, yarn type we took in, besides the merino, was the cotton. Made the same way as the merino, mm -hmm. uh, a fingering weight yard. It has 70% cotton and 30% um, wool. merino wool, yeah, yes. uh, the same as, as our, uh, merino, our merino wool. Yes. Um, and it was important. It took us a while to find the perfect combination of cotton and wool because we wanted uh, the cotton can be very harsh to work mm. with because yes. it's not elastic. Yeah. And we wanted the knitting experience to be a pleasure yes. and and nice and not uh, hurt the hands yes. or yeah. these things. So Shoulders. exactly, yeah. yeah. So so we had to make it a little bit more elastic, and the wool does that. Uh, but how much wool should we add to get? the right yeah. cotton yes. that we wanted so we tried a few things we also added cashmere at one point um we had uh, up to 50 percent of wool which was too woolly and then we tried 10 percent, which was not enough and now we ended with these 30 percent of wool and then the rest is cotton so this is perfect for summer dresses um we have over here this is a dress in our merino wool with long sleeves this is our snowberry dress and, uh, yeah, if you hold that one, mm -hmm. this is the same dress um, with short sleeves in cotton. Uh, this one doesn't have the bubbles. You can choose to knit the bubbles yeah, or not. Yeah. Um, but so so that's what you can do. You can make, the, you, with one pattern, you can make a summer dress for summer using cotton. And for winter, you can make it in wool yeah. with longer sleeves. That's great. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the, the idea, yes. the thought that we mm -hmm. wanted to. And so we also made a silk yarn simply just because we had to. We yes. wanted to. It was, <laughs> yeah. it was uh, too, it's a luxury product and it's a 100% silk and it's perfect for babies and children's clothes. It, the, the thing with silk is that it keeps you warm when you're cold mm. and it, it keeps you cool, cool, cool. When, yeah. you're, when you're warm. So it's perfect actually for every season and it's soft and so it's really nice. This is a barrette silk 
uh, so it's made uh, made from waste from the the um, normal uh, silk production or the yeah. conventional yeah. Uh, silk production. Um, so yeah, this is it. You could also make a, a silk dress. That's beautiful too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, then the then next one that the came. The next one that came was the heavy merino. We wanted um, a, a merino yarn that was a little tougher uh, looking, mm -hmm. but still uh, um, a soft yarn. So we had this made. And um, the good thing about making this was that um, we could match it, the, the gauge, so that one strand of the heavy merino equals two strand of the merino. Okay, so is that DK? So, oh no, it's a bit stronger than worsted. DK. Yeah. Worsted, yeah. Worsted, yeah. yes. And, um, and, and the thing is that we have 80 colors of the merino and I don't know, 20, 30 colors of the... No, of the uh, 50, I think. 50? Yeah. Okay, we have 50 of the... <laughs> I just want to point out to the viewers quickly that you, they can see some yarns behind us and there's two layers here and each, you can see all the, the fine uh, shades here, but there's two layers of shades. So you've got different colors in the same color range behind that. That mm -hmm. just shows you how yeah, many colors. There are many, yeah. So if you chose to, to make a sweater and uh, we didn't carry the color in the heavy merino, you can easily make it with two strands of the merino. Or you can make it with two strands of the cotton for the for the for our summer yeah. lighter or you can even use two strands of silk mm -hmm. so you can have a wool sweater or a silk sweater mm -hmm. so that was really very nice. quickly what's this made out of two of this and one of this okay mm -hmm. okay great yeah good so that's then after that um we took in the silk mohair this was very popular and uh, every everybody would knit with one strand of merino wool and one strand of um of the mohair, the mohair yeah. yes. So we had the the silk mohair made, and uh, uh, it took us a long time to actually to find the right place where we wanted to have it made. Uh, and um, and again, as a matter of peeling, how much of the fluffy hairiness will drop on your black trousers yes. yeah. when you knit. So so uh, we we uh, ended up with this, and we're very happy uh, with this um, particular particular. Uh, uh, Mohair. And the good thing about adding these two together is that when you do that, you get, can I have these? Mm -hmm. You get the same gauge as the heavy merino. So you can make a dress like this, and you can use the same dress in a lighter version with one strand of uh, the soft silk mohair and one strand of the merino. So, so all our yarns, which was the benefit of being... Um, Fairly experienced yeah. uh, knitter, knowing what you wanted and making it yourself, we could make everything uh, interact so our patterns could be more versatile. So you can use different types for different looks and seasons. That's totally mm -hmm. brilliant. Yes, thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> and on the Knitting for Olive website, they also give instructions on how to colour match their yarns, which I think is really interesting, so you can create new colours and textures. So I thought maybe now you could just talk us through some different combinations, show what works really well, but also what's interesting is to show a couple of examples of what doesn't work. Yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so I want to show you a little bit about our colours and how to combine the different shades and different types of yarn and uh, to show you how you can actually change the final color by using a different color of um, silk mohair when knitting with a, a strand of merino. So as an, an example here is our um, hazel uh, merino. It's uh, one of our browns. We have a lot of different browns, but this is one of them. And the, the fun thing is that you can combine it with different colors, uh, shades of, of silk mohair to get a, a different final result. So this is our dusty mousse. If you work the hazel color with the mousse color here, you get a grayish brown. This is a dot brown, and you get a more golden uh, brown yeah. using that one. And another one which is a little more reddish yeah. um, in the, the tone. And then we have a brown. The, this, these two are the same. So, so it's this is the, the solid. true yes. solid uh, hazel color. So you can actually. Uh, differ the the color tiny bits by using different uh, colors of silk mohair when working yes. with the merino. You can really see the difference here live. I'm not sure how well the cameras pick it up, but this one is particularly gorgeous where mm -hmm. you've got this this sort of soft uh, gray blue mm -hmm. coming through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yes, and uh, the thing is when you have 80 colors, uh, the, the colors are very close together. And uh, my gr uh, grandfather, he often says when he comes, 
but why do you have so many whites? They're all the same, right? Like, <laughs> why do you need eight whites? Well, we do because one is a little pink and one is a little blue and one is a little yellow. Um, so, for instance, this shows here. Um, this, these are some of our pinks uh, for four different colors. I don't even know if the if the differences show on the screen, but uh, we have a lighter one here, a little darker, a little more grays. This is a little more brownish, and then uh, a little darker again, and a little more brown. Um, so this is how close they are in shades. Yeah. But we think all of them are necessary to have yes. because sometimes <laughs> you want this and sometimes yeah. you want that. So that's why we have so many and shades. It's just so <laughs> heavenly to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so because it can be very difficult to choose colors when looking at a screen, uh, we have made a color match feature where we help you and guide you in, in choosing colors because some colors can work well together while others they don't. And that can be difficult to see on the screen. So for instance, these, this is a dusty rose and this is, this is, we call it rose clay. It's a little more brownish or, mm -hmm. or, or warm. Um, the, the cool rose, dusty rose, it works well with the purple color. Mm -hmm. You can work these two together for a purple uh, rose yes. Yes. Uh, result. The other one, this one, which is a little more brown, can be worked with this one. This is soft nougat, which is um, a brown color. And you can work these two together with a great result. So what you can do <laughs> is you can take the warm uh, pink with the purple. Yeah. That won't work as yes. well. And you can't take the cool pink with the brown. Yes. That doesn't work. Yeah. So that's why we made the, the color match feature so, so that the knitter won't get the the cool um, with the warm with the warm, the warm exactly yeah. and, and end up with the result that they didn't yeah. want so that's we're trying to help and of course there are no rules anyone can knit whatever they like and if you want to mix cool and warm tones tones you're so free to do so no rules at all but this is just a, a guide a so very helpful want, gu guide yeah, yeah, yeah for online shopping exactly mm -hmm. okay now you do have so many stunning colors but and like your grandfather said why do you mm -hmm. need 10 shades of brown mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you get these um how do you come up with the individual nuances in your shades how do you choose these colors mm -hmm. by looking at them and and feeling that something is missing it's a uh, it's it's very difficult to explain but it's it's a matter of looking at the color range that we have and feeling that something is missing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we try to to work it out with the spinning mill mm -hmm. and we uh, we uh, explain what we want and they will send us samples in different tones very very little variations mm -hmm. of the different samples and we will look at them and and for some reason we always agree yes we can we can have like a, a four or six browns that they have shaded for us to look at and we will all look at each other and say e yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's yeah. it's very uh, um, it's nice. It's it's a good thing about about um, uh, the way you work the, together. The way we work together. Okay. Yes, that, um, these shoes on the table. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Why yeah. are they there? <laughs> they are here because uh, another way of of choosing colors is that uh, we find something that we really like, and um, uh, I bought a pair of shoes and I figured, oh, now this is a beige, but it's a greenish beige. Yeah. We, don't we don't have, have that <laughs> color of yarn. So we had it made. And this is the one we call for fennel seed. Uh, the color is called fennel seeds. Perfect name for it. It is. Thank it you. Is. Because yes. it's really difficult choosing names. I know. Names. Yes. I know. <laughs> 80 names. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Yes. And they're, and, not, and they're not color names. They're, they're, they're something to do with plant or animal or whatever usually. give you the, 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 makes you think of this color yes. is what we aim to we do. We try right? to find the most precise color yeah. from real life. Like where can we, what, what does this look like? Yes. And then we, yeah, yes. we try to find It's difficult though. And especially when they're that close. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we need to wrap the interview up. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of fun. But so just one last question. What is it like to be working together as mother and daughter? It's a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a privilege. It's uh it's uh pointing out the same color when uh, you look at a, a range of colors. It's um it's uh, knowing uh, and trusting each other. To me, it has a lot to do with respect going both ways. Mm. We we take care of different uh, areas of the company. Yeah, yeah. So when Carolina has something that she takes care of, I trust her a hundred percent to do it, uh, to do it well. And I never check up. It's yeah. easy. I know yeah. that if she takes care of that, 
I can just you know wing yeah. it off. It's done. So uh, so that's um, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And then the fast decision making, yeah, yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you can anytime contact each other and say, "Shall we do this?" Yes, move ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we work together. We have days yeah. where you know working yeah. together. We work from home around the dining table. Everything is still held. My dad says, "How can you run a business like that from your dining table?" Well, you can. It's <laughs> nice and cozy, and the coffee is right next to you, and everything is nice. So we work together there, and uh, and decision making is really fast as well. We yeah. we look at each other and we say, "Let's do it." We often agree, and if yeah. we don't, we know right away. Yeah, I can yeah. tell by the look in her eyes or by the, her expression <laughs> that she doesn't like it or that she doesn't agree. And yes. the other way around. Yes. You know if yeah. I don't Yeah, The non-verbal communication. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And recently your son has joined the business. Yes. Say something exactly. quick about that. Yes, I'll say something quick about that. Um, Carolina's brother started uh, in the business um, a year ago. And he came from, uh, this is a fun story, he came from, uh, from uh, corporate banking. Into the into the company, he now takes care of areas of the business that we never thought about, which is fun <laughs> as well. But then uh, he was uh, he was making a presentation of something he wanted to do, and we were watching this presentation. And um, after watching the presentations, we looked at each other and said, "Hmm, that seems nice. Let's do it." And he said, "What? <laughs> I, I mean, are you agreeing to do it right now? I'm used to meeting there, meeting this back and forth, two weeks to make it just a tiny little decision of a tiny little change. But if it feels right, it feels right." So we do it fast decisions. And what a great combination. Yes. So lucky to mm -hmm. have your son mm -hmm. as an accountant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I now have my son, my daughter, and six grandchildren around me all the time. So I'm a very, very fortunate person. I love family business. Me yeah. too. Yeah. It's like people always <laughs> expect the daughter not to be as um, thrilled <laughs> to work with the mother as the other way around. But I am uh, thrilled too. It's a, it's a pleasure working with my mom. And we get to spend a lot of time together. And yeah. I think it works out really well. Yes. It's a mm -hmm. really beautiful story. <laughs> and I am really thrilled to have you on Fruity Knitting. Mm -hmm. So thank you again for well, giving us you. your time thank and you sharing you about your company. Thank you. Thank you. So let's say goodbye to mm -hmm. the audience. Bye. Bye. I'm in love with you. Well, all right. Okay. You win, baby.